Good day to you. Thank you for joining me. My name is Joe Bell, and this recording comes from Silver Mine Retirement Center. Isn't it wonderful to be together on this special day when we remember that Jesus who died rose again. The resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to tackle the subject today of evidence that invites a response. When we think of the res resurrection, there should be a response in our hearts. But before we do so, I'd like to read from the Word of God, have a word of prayer, and then try and unpack the passage. Let's turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You've got your Bible there, you might like to read with me 1 Corinthians 15, and we read from verse 3 and onwards. Listen to what the great Apostle Paul wrote. He said, What I received, I passed unto you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised the third day according to the Scriptures. And that he appeared to Peter, then the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than five hundred of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living. Then he appeared to James, then all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared also to me. Let's have a word of prayer together. Father, thank you for drawing us aside. We are conscious that we are those people who have lost our way. We are sinners. We need your grace, your mercy, your long-suffering. We also pray that at this time when we are facing enormous disruption, sickness, worry and anxiety, we might find your peace and your spirit leading us and pointing us to the Lord Jesus and for his sake alone. Amen. It wasn't until Jesus rose from the grave that anyone gave any thought to worshipping on a Sunday. The Muslims on Friday, the Jews on Saturday, the Romans one day a month. And the Christians chose Sunday because it was to remind them of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And every time we go and worship in a church on a Sunday, we're reminded that Jesus rose again. It's interesting to notice that Christianity began on an unexpected day and in an unexpected place. It began on a Sunday, and it started in a cemetery. However, from the moment that Jesus rose from the dead, there have been those who have been critical, those who have denied that he rose from the dead, and those who have castigated the whole concept. Even on the day that Jesus rose from the dead, the religious and Leaders of the day uh, said that the disciples had stolen away the body. Other people say, well, you know, the Bible is full of contradictions. And others say, well, Jesus was unconscious. He was in a swoon. He was uh, placed in the tomb. It was cool and he recovered. And then others feel that the Lord Jesus influenced is still with us. In other words, he was a folk hero. He was popular with the masses, an outstanding speaker, a great debater, a friend of the poor, the sick and the needy. And just his influence survived. And perhaps there are many people today, and I'll quote somebody who said, he would not believe that Jesus rose from the dead even if he saw him. And so the criticisms continue. Scorn, contempt, ridicule is poured onto the resurrection. 
uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. But what do we believe as Christians? Why do we celebrate today? Why is it fundamental to our faith? Why are there millions of people around the world today who are celebrating the fact that Jesus is alive? Well, we've got to go back to Paul's writings there. He was a great historian, I might say. Perhaps one of the greatest, if not the greatest missionary outside of the Lord Jesus. And of course, he was a great writer. And most many pages in the New Testament belong to him. But he puts out certain reasons as to why there is evidence that invites a response to the resurrection. The first is, he writes and tells us that it's a biblical truth. Listen to what he he wrote in verse 4. Jesus was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And of course, the scriptures he was talking about wasn't the New Testament, but was the Old Testament. And as he refers to the scriptures, the Old Testament was always pointing forward, always pointing towards the Messiah, not a political leader, not a military strategist, not a social crusader, but a sin bearer, a redeemer, someone who would bring us back to God. But the reoccurring theme of all the prophets and of all the psalmists, they spoke about the Lord Jesus not only dying, but rising again from the dead. And so we believe that the prophecies of the Old Testament, which were fulfilled, in authenticate the resurrection of Jesus So first of all, we've got to say it's a biblical fact. It's a biblical truth. The second thing that Paul tells us about is that not only is it a biblical truth, but it's an historical truth. Listen to what he writes in verse 5. Jesus appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time. Some were still alive. Notice that he came. One of the first was to speak to Peter. Peter who had failed him. Peter who had denied him. Peter who had let him down. Peter who had wronged him. But the risen Lord met with Peter. I wonder if in these few moments... I'm speaking to a Peter today. You remember the old days? You used to go to church, you used to read the Bible, you used to pray, even go to Bible study, and on occasions a prayer meeting. But there was a spark in your heart. There was a fervor in your step. You walked with Christ. You were part of the family of God. You contributed in the extension of the kingdom of God. But maybe, Peter, at the moment, you're not there. Things have cooled in your spiritual life. There is an uncertainty in your heart. There is a lukewarmness in your step. Peter, I want to tell you, or young lady, or madam, I want to tell you that the Lord Jesus wants to meet with Peters. He wants to meet with those who are wayward, who have lost their way, who are backslidden, who have let the law down. And then you'll notice that we're told he met with the disciples and then he met with 500 people, 500 brethren. And they all witnessed the fact that the Lord Jesus had risen from the dead. It was in 1981 that more than 10,000 people met in Jerusalem. They all came together to mourn, to grieve, to agonize, 
and to remember the Holocaust. And one of the speakers there was a man by the name of Ernest Michael. And he said around the world today, and he's talked to the people there, there are those who don't believe. There are those who feel that we exaggerate. There are those who feel that we've minimized. They minimize the atrocities. But for all of us standing here today, want to say one thing. We were there. We know. Do you know there were 500 who saw the Lord Jesus, even more than that. But there were on one occasion 500 who saw the risen, erected Lord. Do you know what all they could? They all could say the same thing. We have seen the risen Lord. We just pause for a moment. Have you thought, because it begs the question, why is it that so many people remain unconvinced? They don't believe. They remain indifferent, uninterested, skeptical, unconverted. Because, beloved, it's the one piece of a historical evidence that fix our lives for tomorrow, our lives for the years to come, for death and the grave, for the year after. And if Jesus broke out of death, if he conquered the grave, if he proved that there is life after death, we've got to sit up and take note. And we've got to pay attention to what he said to what he taught, the claims he made. Interesting, Woody Allen said, I'm not afraid to die. I just don't want to be there when it happens. But my friends, we will be there when it happens. And it makes the world of difference if we believe that Jesus rose from the dead. It's a biblical truth. It's an historical truth. And beloved, it's also a supernatural truth. Look what Paul writes. Three little words, so important. He was raised. Something was done for Jesus. He was raised. He didn't do it himself. He was raised. It was a supernatural act of God. He was raised. It was an act of divine power. He was raised. Now that's important because most people in this world are strangers to the supernatural power of God. You see, most people today say, well, what do they say? Well, you know, it's what I believe. And I believe what I can see and what I can hear and what I can touch and what I can uh, smell and what I can taste. Those are the things that I believe. But beloved, if we don't believe the supernatural uh, power of God, then we've got to say we're in great trouble because it's going to mean that how in the world are we going to deal with our sinful heart, our crippling habits, our past, and all those things that are wrong. It takes the supernatural power of God to deal with us to cleanse us, to renew us, to make us new creatures so that we can be born again of the Spirit of God. Only divine power can give us fulfillment to life, prepare us for heaven, and one day take us to heaven. Evidence that invites a response. It's a biblical truth. It's an historical truth. It's a supernatural truth. And last of all, it's an experiential truth. Listen to what Paul wrote. You know, he wrote about himself. And he tells his story in just a few words. And he said, and last of all, Christ appeared to me also. Paul met with the Lord Jesus in a most unusual encounter 
the Lord Jesus already ascended to heaven, but he came down to meet the apostle and to change him. At that time, Paul was a very religious man. He was what they called a Pharisee. That meant he used to pray in the morning and pray in the evening. His prayers would have been repetitive, they would have been formal, they would have been precise. But you know what was wrong with Paul? He had no spiritual life. There was no experience of God. There was no understanding of the gospel. He didn't understand the message of Christ. He was religious, but he wasn't righteous. He was sincere, but he wasn't saved. He was devout, but he wasn't delivered from his sin. His heart was just filled with bitterness, with anger, with hatred, with venom, with hostility, leveled against Christians, and of course, above all, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you know what happened? The Lord Jesus confronted him, met with him face to face. And you know, he became aware as he met with the risen Christ that his religion counted for nothing. He was on the wrong side of the road. He was going in the wrong direction, following the wrong beliefs, belonging to the wrong spiritual family. He was a transgressor of God's law, a lost sinner. And then he had an encounter with Jesus. It transformed his life completely. Suddenly he changed, and it wasn't long before he became a missionary for Jesus. He planted churches. He wrote part of the Bible. And it all came about after having met with the risen Christ. Do you know the Lord Jesus still meeting with people today? You know what he does? He calls them. And then he convicts them. And then he convinces them. And when they respond to him, he converts them. I wonder if somebody listening to my voice this day, the same risen Christ is calling you. Oh, you're religious and you believe this and that and the other, but there's nothing deep down in your heart that has ever changed. And the past and the guilt and the shame and all those things that are there haven't been dealt with, they haven't been cleaned up. And Christ hasn't taken his rightful place in your life. Or maybe you've just turned in and you're one of those that are object to the resurrection. You don't believe the Bible. You're not concerned about the things of God. But in your heart at the moment, you feel that things are not what they ought to be. And you'd like to make a turn like Paul did. Well, the risen Christ wants to meet with you. And there are two thoughts that you need to take. The first is that you will have to turn to him in a spirit of repentance. What do I mean by that? Spirit of sorrow, of shame, of regret of your past your unbelief, your rebellion, your transgression, the things that are wrong. And then come to him by faith and say, Risen Christ, won't you come into my life and reign? Clean me up, change me and make me whole, the person you wanted me to be so that I may follow you and belong to you and that one day when life's journey comes to an end you'll call me home and we'll spend an eternity together would you like to do that In just a moment i'm gonna offer a prayer and you might like to pray it quietly in your heart or aloud wherever you are doesn't matter where you are perhaps you're sitting out there on the balcony or in your car or 
in your lounge or in the kitchen, why not pray this prayer? Do you feel you just want that change and say, Lord Jesus, I want you to come into my life. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, I recognize that you are Lord and King and that you have the right to rule over my life. Lord Jesus Christ, I recognize that there is a dark side to all of my life. I have failed to live in a way which acknowledges you and pleases you. Lord Jesus Christ, please cleanse me from my sins as I turn to you, my Lord and my God. Amen. If you've prayed that prayer, or maybe you're thinking around it and you feel a little bit confused, there's a little booklet that I would like to put into your hand. It's called Easter in three words. And if you send me an email, it's Bishop Joe Bell, all small letters, at gmail.com. I'll send it to you. Give me your address, and at my earliest convenience, and with the help of the post office, we're going to get it to you, so that you can make this booklet a cornerstone as you face and walk a new life together. Maybe others that you know who could listen to this message and you might like to pass it on to them and um, maybe a blessing to them as well. Thank you for joining me. I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. And I trust that as you go out into the day, you're going to have a wonderful day with maybe members of your family, maybe on your own in a time of reflection and quiet but that God will wonderfully bless you. Let's pray together. Thank you for our time together. Thank you, Lord, that you rose again. And we pray now that we may experience that resurrected power in each one of our lives. And may God bless you and keep you and watch over you, both now and now and forevermore. Amen. Have a good day, and God abundantly bless and keep you. Goodbye.